Hello ladies and gentlemen, today's story, Amazing World of Gumball, The Grieving. I don't really have much hope for this creepypasta because I honestly do not like creepypastas that are based off of modern things because, yeah, it would be documented all over the internet if such a thing were to happen, but I could be wrong. So without further ado, let's begin. I always loved Cartoon Network when I was growing up. It was like my favorite channel to watch. Even today there's some good shows on it like Adventure Time and Regular Show. One of the newest shows on Cartoon Network is The Amazing World of Gumball. It's a cute, mildly entertaining show. Not really my cup of tea, but if you're a graphics designer, this might be classified as porn for you. It's a little immature, but my little brother also seems to enjoy it a lot. One day, I was watching Adult Swim when I realized I'd been up so late I haven't even kept track of time. It was already like 4 a.m. I don't recover. I don't recall ever watching Adult Swim this late, so I stayed awake to see what would happen when it ended. A little bumper showed up at the bottom of the screen during a commercial break. It said that a special episode of The Amazing World of Gumball was about to come on. I was a little confused about an episode of a very popular new show coming on at like 5 a.m., but I was bored and I decided to watch it, thinking it would come on later in that day and I could spoil it for my little brother. Sort of a mean thing, I know. The fleshy and energetic intro theme played, and although it played a little differently than I recall, the music was, well, as you can guess, a little different. And the show logo wasn't animated. The colors were done in a rather sloppily. It was done rather sloppily as well, almost like something a little kid would do on a doodle board or a glow board. I ignored it, assuming that it was done for a special reason. The title of the episode was called "The Grieving," a sort of a sad title for a child show, I would imagine. But I didn't really pay much attention to that. It began with Gumball, the show's 12-year-old protagonist, standing alone and facing the corner of a dimly lit classroom. He looked absolutely miserable, a far cry from his cheerful demeanor he usually had. There was no one else in the room, not even his best friend and adopted brother Darwin the Goldfish. And the window showed clearly a night sky outside. I was really starting to get confused on why I would be at the school, especially at night when the show rarely ever takes place then, and when it does, it's like usually a James Bond-esque uh, search and destroy mission. And why was he standing in the corner all sad and alone? After what seemed like a minute of Gumball standing somberly in a corner, the scene just suddenly changed without any transition. We were now in Gumball's house. Once again, the scene fell silent and... A little disquieting. Richard Gumball, uh, Richard Gumball's enormous rabbit father walks in from the kitchen. He looks even more miserable than Gumball that was in the previous scene. Richard isn't wearing his usual attire. He's wearing a rather fancy black suit, a little uncharacteristic of him, as he was usually a slop. He sighs, slumps down on the sofa, and starts sobbing intensely. It sounded like someone who lost something important like a job or a wife. At this point, I was starting to get a little creeped out. The show was heavy on atmosphere, almost no dialogue whatsoever. And bro, it's a silly, fun cartoon I usually look forward to watching with my longer brother. This was just something fucked up. I was beginning to think that... This might have been something the creators did as an experiment or something. A, a test of an animation. Um, the sound, perhaps, though. Uh, it, it could have been aside from the opening theme, which was a different final show. Maybe it was a pilot. I don't know. The episode had been much quieter than it usually was. Only subtle sounds and very little music. And the animation was not anything to write home about either. It was done a bit like an amateur Flash animator on Newgrounds. The character designs were somewhat sloppy and rush-looking, and 
the real backgrounds used for a show looked odd and different. As confused and frightened as I was by this messed up show, for some reason I kept watching it. Poor Richard was sobbing on the sofa as the front door suddenly opened, making me jump at the loud noise compared to the rest of the show. As Gumball and Mother's Nicole, a blue cat like him, stepped in. Like Richard, she wasn't wearing her usual outfit. For some reason, she was in a black dress, wearing a pretty black hat to match. Nicole sat down on a couch to comfort her husband, although she was looking a bit saddened by herself. By this point, Richard crying had begun to get more pained and miserable sounding. This wasn't a normal cartoon crying like in a show. This was more realistic and almost depressing. I almost felt like sobbing myself. Finally, after what seemed like hours, the sad scene at their home ended as it shifted to black, then to the school. We weren't in Gumball's classroom this time. We were at Principal Brown's office. Nicole and Richard were there in their usual clothes, looking more normal and happy than they had before. But they looked still slightly worried. Principal Brown, however, looked extremely sad. He, he quietly and somberly informed them that their children, Annis and Darwin, were not pre present for lunch earlier that day, and they, had been, they hadn't been seen for us a day after that. Nicole was instantly furious at him and begun spouting various insults and calls at him that I don't think would have made it into a... <laughs> I think wouldn't really make it into a program like this, let alone a more mature program like regular show. I was laughing at this because it seemed like the sort of funny for Nicole to flip out in a manner like this and start swearing like a sailor in a G-rated cartoon, but my outlook soon changed when Principal Brown told her something else that finally got everyone to quiet down. His eyes began to tear up as he informed him that they were eventually found, but they were not found alive. He went to graphic and nearly nauseating detail describing how their bodies were found, their parents were sitting in utter shock. I could hardly believe what in the hell was happening, how could such a cheery fun fucking kid show <laughs> be gone taking a dark and twisted turn? I was considering turning the television off, but honestly? I was too intrigued by this. <laughs> I knew that this was indeed a show, but... Seeing something like this, done in a semi-professional fashion, was a once-in-a-lifetime chance. However, this disturbing detail and terrible things that were mentioned begun feasing me. Our flashback scene was shown earlier that day, and the animation of the scene was even worse than earlier. I don't remember as clearly, but I, but I think he began recalling or begun recollating by saying that the school had called the police department when they were first turned up missing, believing that kids simply ran off and decided to skip school that day. They said it was very uncharistic, uncharacteristic of both Darwin and Annis to go skipping school like delinquents. Darwin was a little naive and a bit ditzy, but he was a good kid and wouldn't have dreamed of doing something like that. And Annis was even less likely to run away because, well, it was a straight-A student despite being only four. Which also troubled the police, seeing as a defenseless four-year-old girl went missing, as well as an older boy. The school had been thoroughly checked, so the police searched <laughs> the School had been thoroughly checked, so the police started to search heavily around the wooded area outside of school. It, it took a little time for the police to discover the horrifying fate Annis did. It was in a small clearing outside the school. Annis' head was found in a small box. You likely would have expected that to be shown, well, in a cutesy art style, but it was nothing like that at all. Realistic blood covered a box inside and out, and this isn't hyper-realistic blood, this looked like real blood, and it's not a far shot either, because the way that the show is animated, that it uses real objects to animate as well. Annis' head was done in the normal style, but 
who is drenched in blood and other fluids. Not all of them were hers, apparently. There's a note in a box seemingly written in her blood. It was never stated during the episode what was actually written on it, but it apparently led the rest to Darwin's heavily mutilated corpse. What I remember most about this scene was how out of place it seemed. All the blood and gore from Darwin and Annis' slaughtered and dismembered remains was done in a very realistic and disturbing way. It looked like a scene that had been taken from a crime scene photograph by a professional, not something from a fucking kid's cartoon. The way this scene was animated was different from most of the show as well. What you may know from the series is that they're done in vastly different animation styles, from flash animation to CGI. And I think there's even a character done by someone putting their chin upside down and making a face. Uh, this particular scene wasn't anything like I had ever seen on the show before. Every little detail on Darwin's face was clearly illustrated. It looked like a little zombie. His face was very pale, his eyes had been gouged out by someone. Annis fared no better, or what was left of her anyway. She was naked and her stomach had been slit open, her intestines had been strewn about trees and, brush and brushes in the wood, done again in a very morbid and realistic styling. At this point, I was feeling incredibly ill, and the incredibly disturbing flashbacks had come to an end, so I quickly ran to the bathroom to vomit. I, I, you may guys may know more about this kind of stuff than I have, but I don't watch horror movies at all, and I was feeling better after up chucking, so I realized that I had good timing and ran to the bathroom during a commercial break. It was then I noticed that the show had been running twice as long. It usually, well, ran for 11 minutes, but this episode was about 30. By then, I was wondering if there was any information on the grieving on IO IMDB. So, when the commercials were still playing, I looked up any information about the episode. Nothing came up. No information remotely similar to the plot or name existed anywhere. Now incredibly scared and wondering if anyone else was watching, I quickly dialed my brother Larry and asked him to turn on Cartoon Network and see if he was saying the same shit I was. He was pretty mad that I woke him up at this hour, but he was a nice guy and told me if he would see for me. I thanked him and stayed on the line. The show came back on for the commercial break. The scene had thankfully panned away from the horrific sight with the mutilated children and was back to the principal's office. I asked Larry if he saw the cartoon animals talking and crying, and since they were doing that on my TV, and to my surprise, he saw nothing like that. Instead, it was an old U Looney Tunes short. In utter shock, I dropped the phone and ran to the other TV to turn it on as hard as, and as I pressed the buttons as hard as they would, it would not shut off either. I tried every single button, and none of them were doing the same thing. I tried unplugging the whole TV set as well, but nothing worked. The TV stayed on no matter what I did. Larry had hung up, assuming I was playing a fucking joke on him, and I, I, I guess I was alone once again. The door was locked from the outside as well somehow, and my door to my bathroom was now locked as well. I was, I was a prisoner in my own house. It, it seemed that I had no choice but to call the police, since my other family members were gone that night, and... It was the same reason I could stay up so late in the first place. When I hurried to dial the number, I accidentally dropped the phone into a cup of Pepsi. Now I was very scared. I had no choice but to finish the episode. I turned on all the lights in the room and under the gowns, hiding under my... I got... turned on the lights in my room and got under the covers, hiding like my little brother does while I make him watch scary movies of me. I apparently missed a little bit, but Gumball's parents were talking to Principal Brown, so not much... <laughs> so that not much Nicole was asking him if Gumball was alright. Apparently, apparently, she hadn't remembered him when Principal Brown told her what happened to Darwin and Annis. He looked slightly confused and shocked for a moment, and then he explained that he thought Gumball was out sick today, and he'd spent the day home by himself. Nicole at this point screamed and wailed while Richard quietly told him very out of character in a voice that they thought Gumball had gone on the bus this morning, but it didn't seem that way. The police were called out once again to search the building and small force outside of Eleanor Jun Junior High. They had found him in Miss 
Simeon's classroom hanging by a nose with a blood-covered knife behind him and blood covering his clothing. The episode ended with a shot of Gumball's dead body hanging there in the corner by his by a hook through his nose, then fade into black. The credits rolled silently, not like the usual way Cartoon Network did, with their annoying airs and promos that <sighs> squishes half the squee- screen when the credits rolled, usually in a slow manner, and they're not fun to watch either. Just a little creepy, plain white text and <sighs> comic sans scrolling down on a black background. I only recognize Ben Bequette's name, but... He was only the creator of the show. The rest of the people I never heard of, and the copyright notice at the end said, At Cartoon Network Studios 2001. Which was incredibly odd, seeing as this was a new show for 2011. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the amazing world of Gumball. The Grieving. Now, to be honest, I did cut the story a little short, because the very end ruins the story for me. And I'll, I'll tell you why. At the very end, the character basically says, Oh, I called the police, and then the police took me out for dinner, and then there was some government agents, and something... Uh, even when all signs pointed to him being just some crazy liar, the police still got, like, a TV station actually covered his story. And, well... Yeah, apparently he did actually saw a real crime scene, and... That was not surprising. If it wasn't for the ending, this story would have been 7 out of 10. There was some things that I found wrong with this, but it, I gotta say this was pleasantly, pleasantly enjoyable because this, uh, honestly, my expectations were quite low for a story like this. And to be honest, it was that ending kind of fulfilled those expectations. However, the, the rest of the story was actually well written, I could read it clearly, and there was no bad writing hiccups like in some other stories I read. The story was coherent, even if it did rely on blood excessively. It used a mixture of both on masking, uh, like not explaining at all, and then going into too much detail, which honestly, I, I guess could be considered a good thing, but 9 times out of 10, it's not. But yeah, this story, I would have to say, is a rather good one, and I would recommend giving it a read yourself, and if you can stomach that ending, um, read the ending too. But yeah, essentially what I wanted to do was give this story a read. You will be seeing this on the top, tw the top, tw like, something 22 Lost episodes, so... Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. This has been your host, That Creepy Reading, and today I'm signing off.